Slide is out. So you're broadcasting the slide is up. Hey, this is Dr. Renee Thompson coming to you from Fostering Wellness in Brandon, Rutland, and Randolph, Vermont. At Fostering Wellness, we focus on lifetime wellness. That means from preconception to pregnancy to delivery and beyond. In order to do that the best, we take care of families. We take care of a lot of families. Now, if you're a parent watching this, first of all, I applaud you. I applaud you on taking time, extra time, to get some information, to maybe figure out a way to ask new questions or answer some old questions, to be able to move forward in the health of your family and the future of your children. If you're a parent, you know that the decisions we make every day don't just affect our family and our kids in this moment, in this time, but it affects them a couple hours from now, tomorrow, five years from now, 10 years from now. One of our goals here is to think about the future of that child and think about the future of that future of the child with the parents. So when we think of that, we're preventing, looking at preventing sickness, at preventing disease, at preventing chronic illness, but also working toward the optimal function in that child. If you're a parent, you also know that the decisions you make every day, they're not easy. Parenting is not easy. That's the one for sure thing. You love your kids and it's not always easy. Those are certain every day. So when parents come into us and they ask us questions and they're like, look, I, I have information over here or, or over here. I feel like I don't have enough information. I'm not sure how to think about it. I'm not sure how to filter it. Um, maybe what are your thoughts on it? We, we get those questions a lot. So today I wanna to go over some of that with you. I wanna follow some basics in there. And the stuff we're gonna talk about today is, is a non-invasive, a natural approach to parenting, working with things that are known to build health in us, that are known to build health in our children and in their future, and they're things that are, again, non-invasive in our children, and they're things that have never been recalled. So that's really positive in helping our children move forward naturally to reach their optimum. Not just not being sick, not just being kind of okay and getting by, but truly being well in whether they're playing with their family, practicing sports, sitting in school, playing an instrument, that they're working toward that more optimal function. So if you give me a second here, I'm gonna pull up my screen my slides and we will work together on this to, to take a look. So again, in this approach to natural parenting, we're gonna talk about it as a journey, as a journey. And we're all gonna start at different places in our journey. Some of the stuff we're gonna talk about today, you might think, oh yeah, I've got that. Man, we've been doing really well on that. Or yeah, I know, we've been letting that slide a little. Or maybe you'll think, oh, I haven't really thought of it that way or heard of it that way, but that might be a functional thing for our family. Maybe we can do that moving forward. Or you know what, maybe part of this approach doesn't really fit into our family very well. But anywhere we start, this journey toward natural parenting, this journey of life in general, is just that it's a journey. We have to start somewhere and keep making the best decisions we can with the information we have moving forward. Now, there's a saying in chiropractic from one of the founders of chiropractic that as the twig is bent, so it grows, so grows the tree, B.J. Palmer. As the twig is bent, when we have a little twig or a little sapling from early on, if that gets bent or twisted into one shape, whether it's leaning off to the side or as in this cool picture here was fashioned to look like a really fun person tree that's excited and full of life, um, that's how that grows. 
If it's bent over to the side, part of it's going to twist up and reach for the sunshine. It wants to be healthy. It wants to live. It's designed to be able to function and have life. And the stronger start it gets standing up straight and tall toward the sky, the better and the stronger its life is in the future. Again, that's why we take care of families. That's why we're answering some questions today um, for you, for your children, for your future, so that as you have these precious little ones at home with you, or maybe you're planning on precious little ones, or maybe you're just curious, you can figure out how to grow that healthiest, more optimal future moving forward. There are certain things we know in life that always move us toward health that build wellness for us. When we build up momentum toward wellness, we like to call that in our office, wellmentum. Wellmentum. I want wellmentum in my life. I want momentum that is moving me toward better function, better decision making, better sleep processes, betterment in my relationships. I want that wellmentum in my life. You see this little guy over here on his little scooter and he's like, yeah, I've got this. Well, Mentum, bring it. I own this scooter. The toy is almost as tall as him, but he's crazy proud. His mental attitude there is great. He's flexing his muscles. He's ready to make it happen. He is focused on that well momentum and being as optimal as possible. Now, again, the things that lead us in that direction, that build that well momentum in all of us are things like nutrition, exercise, sleep, our mental attitude, like this guy, yeah, I've got this, let's do this, I'm gonna own this, right? And nervous system function. Now the top three of those we hear about frequently. We hear about nutrition, exercise, sleep. We're bombarded by it actually in our media. We hear, if you wanna look better, if you wanna feel better, if you wanna be more successful in three days, do these things, right? We hear about those a lot. The last two, however, they get dropped. They get dropped and it's really sad. Now, thankfully, we're starting to hear about them more, but our mental attitude plays a huge role into how we approach our day. If we have a negative attitude, we're not gonna wanna move and exercise. We're gonna go to comfort food versus wellness food. We're not gonna get the sleep we need to. If we have a positive attitude, it drives us toward good nutrition, toward wanting to move our bodies, toward better, more restful sleep. Now those top four, those are crucial toward health. And those start to lead us toward wellmentum, toward 100% in our life. But I will never utilize those top four to the best of my abilities if my nervous system is interfered with. My nervous system is the master system of my body, of all of our bodies. It runs the show. It takes the food we eat and says, you know what? Break it down this way, stomach, intestines. Absorb this many of these nutrients. Muscles, when you're exercising, I want you to squeeze this hard. And I want you to know that your foot is right here so you have the balance and stability you need. When you're sleeping and you're coordinating to heal while you're asleep, it's your nervous system that says, you know what, this is how you rebuild. This is how you heal. This is how you regenerate yourself. And when my nervous system is clear and not interfered with, I have a better mental attitude and I make better hormones and chemicals in my body that promote a better mental attitude. Those are all things that if I'm using those throughout my day, and if I'm helping my children learn decisions in those throughout the day, that those will lead us toward that 100%, like this little guy over here. Now, other things, not using these correctly, would build up sick momentum. I don't want momentum toward sickness. I don't want to move towards zero. That's not okay with me. That's not okay for me, for my body. That's not okay for me, for my two children. That's not okay for my nieces and nephews. I wanna see these kids start young and well and stay that way, grow up strong and powerful. Now we kind of look at this little chart here and we think, all right, well, 100% sounds like a lot. It could be really hard to reach 100%. Well, I'm gonna tell you something. We're not stationary on this scale. We're not stationary. We're either moving one direction or the other. 
we either move toward 100% or 0%. And the choices we've made up till today that lead us one way or the other decides for us whether we have well-mentum or sick -mentum. So for instance, if I'm only ever eating pizza and drinking soda, maybe I've built up some sick -mentum. If I eat a salad one day, I'm not going to turn around 100% toward well -mentum. And as we make these choices every day, it's easier to make them lifelong if we learn them when we're young. If we learn them when we're young. So we want to build that well momentum in these children and we want to help parents think through this. How do I approach this well momentum to move toward 100%? Even if sometimes life has happened at me and now I'm only capable of 95%, I want to move that direction. All right? So let's talk about that first one, that nutrition. How many of you parents have said this? Finish your dinner, please. Finish your dinner. Just eat your food. Just two more bites. You can do it, right? We've all done that. Or this is it. This is dinner. This is what you have. This is what we're eating as a family, right? We've all been there. How do we get our kids to do that? How do we get them to eat the right types of foods? How do we know what types of foods? Well, some things to focus on early on in the beginning are proteins and fats. Now, when I say beginning, I'm talking infants. Proteins and fats. And we're like, okay, well, that sounds kind of funny. I'm not going to feed my infant a steak, right? Okay, work with me here. Breast milk is full of beautiful protein and beautiful fat. Now, for some reason, if you've had difficulty nursing, formula is a close second to that and also has a good balance for um, infants to be able to get in that protein and fat that they need. But breast milk is naturally the ideal for the baby to be able to get the correct amount of proteins and fats they need for neurological development, brain development, eyesight, hair, skin, organ development as they continue to grow. The protein is kind of like, um, uh, Dr. Sear puts it this way uh, in Sear's Guide to Children, it's kind of like a meshwork for building a road. You need the structural parts to be able to build the road. And the fats kind of help lay some groundwork and, and insulate that and, and build on top of that. Um, they also help us absorb proper nutrients in our body. They help protect our nervous system as it develops. Other key things to focus on when, when little ones are little and they're starting to eat solid foods are fruits and veggies. And these are a really good place to start with your infant. Now we're going to get into these a little deeper in just a minute, but those fruits and veggies as you start solid foods are going to be a really good place to start and then later add in grains. This is kind of a little different than what we hear often. We're kind of told, okay, so start with the breast milk, start with the formula, then at, you know, three, four months, if you want your baby to sleep through the night, put a little cereal in there, whether it's oat cereal or rice cereal, it'll fill them up and they'll sleep a little better. And then, you know, five to six months, start giving them more cereal during the day. Well, we are one of the only countries that starts our babies on grains early. Now, if you started your kids on grains, they're okay. They're going to make it. But I'm going to tell you right now that kids who are started on grains generally crave more starchy, sugary foods in the future, and it changes the way they develop their palate. So children who are started on vegetables and vegetable purees and fruit purees um, tend to have less of sweet tooth cravings in the future, and as they grow and they develop, make healthier food choices, which leads to less inflammation overall, and inf leading to less inflammation helps them lead to less chronic illness. So let's take a look at these. Grubbies, let's take a look at this food. In our house, we call them good grubbies when my kids were little. So proteins, where do we get these proteins as our kids start to grow and develop? Well, first of all, we said that breast milk, formula, eggs, farm fresh eggs have great protein, have great fat for kids as they start to grow and develop. And again, this is six months and beyond. Cheese is another good one. Um, cheeses such as a uh, cheddar cheese, um, clean, not orange, white cheddar cheese uh, is better for kids. And don't really start that. Um, type of dairy food until closer to a year old. 
yogurt, you can start a little bit earlier, around nine months old. There's a difference here. Uh, dairy can sometimes be inflammatory to our systems or to our GI tract. So when we're starting yogurt in a kid, yogurt has been cultured with bacteria, with good bacteria that helps our immune systems function and develop even stronger, okay? So when we're having that yogurt, it breaks down, that bacteria and it breaks down some of the things that might be inflammatory to our bodies. So that yogurt starting around nine months, if you know the child hasn't shown any sensitivities to dairy, um, when they're nursing and the mom has been having dairy, or if there's no known dairy sensitivities or allergies in the family, then you can start that full fat, organic, plain yogurt around nine months old. And I emphasize plain there because plain does not mean vanilla. Plain means plain. There's no flavor. If you're buying vanilla yogurt, it's got sugar in it. If you're buying fruit yogurt, it's got sugar in it. If you're buying almost any flavored yogurt, it's most likely got sugar or an artificial sweetener in it. Do not add those in at nine months old. You want full fat, plain, organic yogurt. Um, and the best option is from cows that have been grass fed. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Another good source of protein for these kiddos as they start to develop are nut butters. Now some of these you're gonna wait till a little bit closer to a year to start them on. And here I put a few on. Um, sunflower butter is good. Again, it's got good protein, good fats. Almond butter is a little higher in the uh, protein category. Cashew, again, is a good mix of protein and fats. If you notice, I did not put peanut butter on here, which is kind of funny, because as we grow up in the good old USA, which I love dearly, um, we're taught that PB&Js are the go-to meal, right? Every day, PB&J, that's what kids should eat. Well, if you're going to have a PBJ, do it very specifically. If you're doing white bread, that's breaking down in your body as a sugar, which we're going to get to in a little bit. If you're buying a jelly that has sugar in it, now we have fruit sugar and we have added sugar. If we're buying um, one of the popular brands of peanut butter, the likelihood is it has bad fat in it and sugar. So we just put a whole bunch of sugar on a plate for a little tyke. So if we're going to do this, there's better specific ways to do this. Again, sunflower butter, almond butter, cashew butter. You can find a lot of these without any added sugar. Um, it helps your kid develop a palate that's a little more lean, that likes more of the fatty protein flavor versus the let's spike my insulin, I got to crave the sugar response. Um, another good source of protein as they grow is poultry or meat. Uh, really early on as they're developing a little easier for their digestive systems are things like free range chicken. Uh, seafood is also a really good source of protein for these kiddos. Um, a good, if you're, you know, if they're, again, if you don't have any seafood sensitivities in your family, a good one is salmon and wild caught Alaskan salmon is a really good one. And we're going to look at that again in just a minute. Again, if you're going to do the peanut butter and jelly sandwich, if you're going to pick a bread rather than a white bread, um, I would go toward a sprouted grain. As they start to grow and develop and you add grains, spouted, sprouted grains are less irritable to most GI tracts, and they're high in iodine, which means that's going to help your kid's thyroid grow and develop um, and help build healthy immune responses in your child as they grow instead of just breaking down quickly in your, in your kiddo's body and causing an insulin spike from a sugar rush, okay? Now, fats. Again, breast milk and formula for the inf infant. These, these are going to be the best sources of fats. Breast milk is really high in fat. It can be around 44% fat. Now, the foremilk in breast milk is a little higher sugar content, and the hind milk is going to have the higher fat content. So you want to make sure when your infants are eating that they're completely finishing one side, that you're working um, a little bit as that little one is eating to work your milk down and forward uh, from the back of the, of the breast to get that hind milk forward so those babies have the fats they need as they grow and develop that brain and eyesight. As baby starts into solid foods, 
Avocados are a great source of fat, and they have that creamy, full-fat mouthfeel that babies really like, which is really nice. Again, the nut butters are a really good blend of protein and fat. The seafood, the Alaskan salmon especially, it does have good protein, but it's very high in good fats um, as these kiddos develop. Flax or flax oil. This is an easy thing to add to a little baby puree of food if you make your own baby food. Um, you could even sprinkle it over some eggs and usually they don't even notice if it's a if it's a flax meal. And again, those eggs, they're best farm fresh or organic. Um, butter or grass-fed dairy, again, adding that in around nine months, and it can be full-fat dairy at that age. In that first year of life, uh, the main source of fuel for little ones is fat, and that helps them grow to develop, um, have the nutrients they need, and build that immune system um, the best that they can. So those are, those are good sources. If you're going to make some baby food out of this or out of some fruits and veggies, a good way to do that is, is throw a few of these things, even a scoop of uh, yogurt, maybe a scoop of almond butter or cashew butter, sprinkle a little flax in there, add a quarter or a half of an avocado, puree that together, let the kiddo uh, eat that, and they start to develop a palate that leans them toward healthy proteins and fats instead of the sugary, starchy taste. So I keep mentioning those sugars. So let's take a look at that, shall we? Again, early on, that four milk has the sugar that the baby needs. Dairy, again, full fat. So that goes back to our fat. It goes back to our protein. Um, but the lactose in dairy is a positive sugar that isn't going to, going to spike the child's insulin um, and cause them to be on an up and down sugar spike and crash. Apples, and really fruit falls into this category, but apples are a high sugar fruit. So when we're feeding these to our kiddos, it's nice to slice them up. It's nice to chunk them up when they're little, let them chew at them. You know, they only have a few teeth in their head, so they're kind of chewing, kind of gumming, and that's good. But they don't, they don't need a whole apple at once in that first year of life. They, they might have a quarter apple, you know, or they might chew on some of it and then half of it ends up on the floor. But this is a high sugar food. Um, and so sometimes people get a little nervous about fruit and how much fruit to eat because they have so much sugar. But when you're having sugar within the scope of the fruit, it's a sugar that's not going to spike your insulin. And again, when we eat sugar and it rushes into our bloodstream, our insulin goes up to store the sugar and, and it kind of just creates stress in the body. But when we're having that sugar within the scope of the fruit, we're also absorbing fiber vitamins, minerals, other anti-inflammatory nutrients that work with us, and there's less of this irritable effect on the body. Beans and legumes um, also have a little bit of a starchy uh, presence to them, uh, which, which digest as a healthy sugar. Sweet potatoes are a preferred source of starchy foods or sugary foods um, early on. They, they taste good. They're a healthy starch, and they have better nutritional value than a white potato. And again, sprouted whole grains. Anytime you're eating a starch food or a grain food, that to a certain extent will break down to sugar in the body. So when you're eating whole grains that are sprouted, there's a higher protein content, and they are a complex carbohydrate. That complex part of it means they're not just going to rush right into your bloodstream as sugar and um, spike your insulin like a piece of white bread would do. Also, to help get all the nutrients in that we need, again, within the scope of a fruit or within these foods here, keeping the peels on is positive. Now, again, early on when they don't have all their teeth in their head, they might have trouble chewing up that apple slice. But once they get big enough to keep it on, keep, keep the peel on there. That's good for them. That's good fiber. That's good nutrients. Things to not put in your kid or try to avoid putting in your kid are things like sucrose, dextrose, and glucose. These are very simple sugars. They're, that sucrose, the first one, that's basically table sugar. So what most people use as sugar in their house, when we buy a, a bag of sugar, that's what they're talking about. So sucrose 
dextrose and glucose, again, are very simple, small sugars. So when we eat those, they cross our intestines very quickly, go right into our bloodstream and spike it, spike our sugar content, spike our insulin. And this is when, uh, you know, you see kids at a birthday party and they're eating cake and they have icing all over their face and they're going crazy. They have the sugar high, right? This is what you see. What comes after the sugar high? The crash, right? The sugar crash, which affects mood levels, um, which affects our concentration abilities. So if we're putting these into our kids on a regular basis or a couple times a day, we're, we're putting our kids in a state that makes them a little more manic and then drop and then manic and then drop. And it's hard for them to even find an even hormonal level in there when we're doing that. And it creates unnecessary stress in our kids, not just mentally, but physically. It creates stress in the chemicals in their bodies, and that's that's hard on them. Corn syrup is another one that really spikes insulin. Hydrogenated oils. What the heck are those? Maybe you've heard that name tossed around. Hydrogenated, hydrogenated oils, uh, it's basically a preservative. It's basically oils um, that have been changed in their shape so that something will last on the shelf longer. You'll find these in things like fried food, fast food, crackers, cookies, chips, shortening, uh, some types of peanut butter. Um, and that's not to say it's in all of them, but read the labels. Go beyond the nutritional facts on a label and read the ingredients. If something's saying high fructose corn syrup, modified food starch, sucrose, dextrose, glucose, hydrogenated oils, you might think twice before putting that in your cart. All right? Another thing to stay away from, food coloring. Food coloring, and a big one is red dye number 40. This is known to have some neurological effects on children um, and can really amp them up. Um, in some cases, kids who have ADD or ADHD do better when they're having no food coloring at all, but especially red dye number 40, as it causes a lot of extra stress in their bodies. And so getting that um, either out of their system or never putting it in their system, you know, if you're just starting out with little ones, is, is a good place to start. So if you see these things on the labels, you might think again. Now some of this we're already thinking, oh my gosh, but you know, sometimes fast food is quick and it's easy. And and you know, grandma uses shortening all the time. And the and the crackers they got, oh, I just checked the box and they have hydrogenated oils. Or my kid only ever wants to eat mac and cheese and goldfish. You know, what what do I do? These are some questions we get. You know, my my kid, my kids love ice cream sandwiches. They they want one every day. Well. I'm gonna say something that sounds very basic. That sounds very basic. Basic. Don't buy it. Don't buy it. Don't put it in your cart. If you're at the grocery store and those things don't end up in your cart and you go home and they don't end up in your cabinet or your pantry or your fridge, then you don't have them. And it's hard. And that doesn't mean you can't ever have them. Have them. It doesn't mean you can't ever make that educated decision every once in a while to have that. Um, but really, the easiest way to, to take something out of your kid's diet is to not bring it into the house. And again, it sounds very elementary, sounds very basic, but I'm telling you, it's helped a lot of parents avoid the fight and the battle and the hassle when they just say, oh, sorry, we're not, we're not having that. I don't, I don't have it. We don't have any. No, we're not going to have any. We just We just don't have any. And, and it's done. Another good way to help the kids in the kitchen to see this is by what we do. They watch us. You know this. They watch our every movement. They hear our every word. Sometimes it's a little concerning how much they watch us and then reflect that back at us. Um, but when we're cooking, when we're eating, when we're making healthy choices for our body, when we're putting beautiful colorful food into our bodies um, that's full of vitamins and minerals and enzymes that we need, our kids get excited when we say, oh, I'm eating this carrot because it's really, really good for me and for my eyesight and, and vitamin A is really good for my body or I'm eating these green leaves and oh, they're going to give me power um, and, and I'm eating avocados because it's really good fat for my brain. The kids get excited. They see you be excited about food. They want to crawl up on the kitchen counter and help make food. My son isn't crazy about avocados. If you put one in front of him, he wouldn't just eat it. 
But when he crawls up on the counter and makes guacamole with mommy, oh, I'm telling you what, that kid, he thinks and he knows he makes the best guacamole in the world because he did it with mommy because it was team mommy and team Mason. And when he crawls up there, he is willing to eat guacamole with the cilantro, with the red onions, with the lemon, with the garlic, with all the other good stuff we put in it because he helped, because he was invested and he saw mommy get excited about the food and it was playtime. When you put it in you, and you make it exciting and you do it with your child, they want to be part of that and it helps them want to make good choices of what they put in their body. Now we've talked about some healthy things regarding nutrition about what we put in our body. Now I wanna think about things that are around us or on the outside of our body or what we put on our body. Kids, <laughs> oh, they make messes. You would have never guessed, right? Um, I have a friend who jokes that she knows where her daughter has been in the house always because she leaves a trail, right? Kids are messy. So we clean up after them. So we choose, okay, well, this product is really good. They say good things about this. This is supposed to maybe lower germs or this really cuts grease. So what do I do? And then you read the back of it and it says, don't make contact with skin, right? Uh, if you take this call the poison control center, uh, it don't, don't ever let a child handle this. And you're like, oh, so why, why am I spraying this where they're eating their food? Is that a concern? Well, in 2012, over 40% of human exposure to poison were in kids under six, under six years old. So we got to ask ourselves, what can we do to still clean up, to still keep a healthy home without uh, without all the toxins. Two really easy ways. One, I'm going to give you a little recipe for uh, disinfect surfaces with citrus and vinegar. So to do this, you're going to just grab a mason jar, a big mason jar. You're going to fill it or whatever size. It's it's all proportional, but you're going to fill it with citrus peels and undiluted white vinegar. You want it straight up. You don't need to add any water in there. You're going to make yourself um, a little cleaner, a little concentrate. Um, and you're going to let that just sit, just let it sit on the counter or in the cabinet for three days, pour that into a little squirt bottle and you have yourself a cleaner that smells good, that works to cut grease from the oil of the citrus peels and, um, and the vinegar and helps prevent, uh, mold and mildew. And that's really positive. Another really good way of cleaning and making solutions is using essential oils. Now, there's a lot of different brands of essential oils out there. We use essential oils in our home. We use vinegar in our home. Again, that doesn't mean you have to, but these are some options for you. If you are going to use an essential oil, use a therapeutic grade. Find one that's a therapeutic grade essential oil, and that will be a better choice for you and your family. There are also other natural cleaning products out there. Um, <clears throat> you've probably heard of some, uh, Seventh Generation, Myers. Um, th those are two really good products. If you're looking into essential oils, I might recommend things like Young Living or Doterra. And again, those are just to name a few. Um, um, but those are some good ways to, to clean our home without without inviting toxins into our home, okay? All right, so let's think about this next one, this exercise. Playtime, woohoo, right? We kinda all wish we had a little more playtime. For kids, this is crucial. We know kids like to play. We know kids like to move. But if we're going to build health in our children, they need to be able to move. They need to be able to play. When they're outside playing, when they're inside playing, when they're playing alone, when they're playing with friends, it all it helps them in all different ways of development. It all plays into their brain development, to their fine motor skills, to their relationship development, and it connects them with their family when they play with in their own family, which means yes, you as a parent play with your children, right? Let's take a look at this. If kids are outside playing and they're they're creating, right? If it's an unstructured play, they're creating. They're learning how to move their bodies. They're learning balance. They're learning hand-eye coordination. They're learning creative skills, problem-solving skills. They're also outside getting dirty. Right? Now, a lot of times we're like, oh, don't jump in the puddle. Oh, please don't get muddy. And sometimes it might not even be the fact that they're muddy, might be the fact we don't necessarily want to clean it up. Right? But when they do get muddy, when they do get dirty, they're exposed 
to microbes, to, to little living organisms that challenge their immune system. So their immune system sees that in little doses and is able to conquer these little microbes, which strengthens the immune system in the future. They're also exposed to positive microbes. So for instance, in the dirt, there's certain, certain flora, certain bacteria that actually can help our gut health. That sounds kind of crazy, but it actually can help and be beneficial to our gut health. So kids who play in the dirt and who have dogs, because dogs are running around in the dirt and then come in the house and the kids pet the dog, they're actually shown to have better, healthier bacteria in their gut, which helps their immune function and that nervous system function, that master system of the body. Kids who are playing organized sports learn to work within a team. They learn to play, be coachable. Um, they learn to be uh, work with positive encouragement. Um, they, they learn when they've made a mistake, how to shake it off and move forward. And they learn when they're, um, that their parents are there to cheer for them, support them, and move on. And that helps them in relationships as well. Again, hand-eye coordination, playing alone taking time, just experiencing our world. Sometimes we need time alone and some people need that more than others. Some kids need that more than others. Some kids just need time to be by themselves, to play by themselves. And maybe as they grow up, they might be a little more introverted. And in their own time, they'll come out and be social when they're ready. And then when they need a break, they might go back and play by themselves. When we're outside playing with our kids, when we're inside playing with our kids, it creates a safe feeling in our kids. It creates an admired feeling. It creates uh, trust between the parent and the child. And that's really positive. Uh, and we're going to talk about it in just a minute for their mental attitude and their development and security within, within their family. And that creates happiness and wellness and mental attitude function and physical better function for families all together. Again, if our kids see us do it, see us be excited about it, that's what they're going to want to do. Those are the choices they're going to start to make. So when we, um, when we think of the next step in this leading us toward health, sleep. This is a big one, right? This is a big one if you've ever had kids, and not just for the kid, but for you. You're hoping for some sleep some nights. So we're just going to look at this pretty quickly, but infants they sleep the majority of 24 hours, right? And we hope that they choose the 24, the majority of 24 hours at nighttime when we're asleep, but that's not always the case. And getting an infant on a schedule to sleep can be a little tricky. It can be hard, especially if they do get their days and nights upside down. But these kids are spending so much time, these little babies, in growing and developing and uh, making new cells and, and, and getting bigger and eating food that they're going to put into function in their body that they need that sleep to be able to do that healing and restoring and regenerating and growing. That's why they're sleeping the majority of 24 hours. Most of their energy is going into growing. So when we're working with those kids, the National Sleep Foundation talks about kids who put themselves to sleep often become better self-soothers in the future. So there's a lot of debate in the sleep world for infants um, about co-sleeping, um, about crying it out. So let me, let me put this kind of in between out there, okay? When we have a child who's nursing and they put themselves to sleep um, uh, or, or, they're, or they're put to sleep while nursing, they fall asleep and they're laid down, they wake up and can sometimes wonder, okay, where did the breast go? Where, where did my bottle go? Where did my parent go? And that can sometimes be startling. Now, on the other hand, if children are allowed to, to cry it out, some parents feel like, okay, well, they need me. This is really hard. This can be really difficult. And generally in that pattern, when a child is crying itself to sleep, it'll cry, it, it'll, it'll scream um, longer, then it will pause, then it will cry a little more, then it will pause a little longer, cry again but a little less and the pauses eventually become longer so those those can be the two ends of it and again it can be hard to let the child cry like that a good kind of in between to train the little one from early on is when they do get sleepy at the breast but they have had their full meal they got their four milk and their high milk just rouse them 
wake them up, rouse them a little bit, you know, burp them and lay them down so they're in that half sleepy, half awake mode. So they realize mommy's here or daddy's here and they love me and they're laying me down. This is my routine and I'm learning this and I still feel safe and they don't go into the scream. Um, and that can be a helpful way for a lot of parents to be able to start. Again, if you've ever had kids, one way might work really well for one kid, another way might work better for another kid. And in the same kid, the same way might not work all the time. <laughs> but when you and your spouse or your partner decide this is the way we're gonna do this, just make sure you're on, you're on the same team about that and you're working together and you're supporting each other and you're both feeling comfortable with it. Toddlers, they're gonna sleep a little less, but still, you know, they're moving. They're on the run. They're burning energy. They got things to do in the world to find out about. And so they're moving. So they still sleep 11 to 14 hours a day um, to, to, uh, to get most of the regeneration that they need. Grade school kids, sleep nine to 11 hours. Now this gets tricky because in grade school, you start sports, you start band, you have homework, you have long school days, and it's exciting to get involved in all of that, but it can soon become stressful to the kid, and we need to watch for signs of our kids wearing out, becoming overly stressed, feeling like it's work to even leave the house, um, maybe getting more clingy with our parents' time, and sometimes in that reaction, they might they might have uh, stronger reactions to things. They might act out a little bit more, and, and because they're stressed, but also to to get more attention. So make sure with these kids that you're still spending quality time with them. Get on the floor, color with them, play with them, have family game nights. Take a night of the week where you say, we are doing nothing. This is our family. This child is busy and needs a rest and they need sleep to restore and to even create memory for everything they're learning during the day. They need, they need sleep to be able to put that all together for them. Teens. They still need about nine hours. They might like, you know, 12 to 15, but physiologically they need close to nine. Do remember that teens also are under a lot of stress. There's a lot of hormone production that's going on. They're still growing. They're still growing. Um, all their growth plates are not fused, so that's a lot of work, so they still need that sleep. Now that mental attitude. For kids, for little ones, most of that comes from uh, parents. Honestly, how are we being built up? How are we being talked to? Is the tone hard or harsh always? Or is it encouraging and loving? Um, and are we, are we working to uh, help our children make more positive decisions um, in a manner that helps them want to make more positive decisions in the future? Um, or are we just... Uh, you know, bearing down on them, making them feel like they could never make a positive decision. So again, I, I don't want to get in into all of that, and, and you can work with that in your own family. Um, but mental attitude is a big part of how families spend time together. Um, when we're doing that, when we're spending time together, we have memories that we take with us. If you think back to your own childhood, there are certain points in your childhood when you think of good memories that always come to the top. And we want to spend time with our kids to teach them good lessons, to, to teach them how to live life, to teach them how to be excited about good choices for us in life, but also just to build memories with that. You know, I hope when my son grows up and he makes guacamole for his family that he's like, you know what, I did this with my mom and I used to crawl on the counter and why don't you kids crawl up on the counter and we'll do this together. And that'll be a fun thing, a fun memory that also taught them good choices of what to put in their body. So we kind of think, all right, well, all of this is playing time into my kids and, and their mental attitude and there's so much to do in a day and there are sports and there are homework and there's practices and, and, and what do we do? How do we do this? And it seems overwhelming. So I want to share with you something for your mental attitude um, that my mom shared with me a long time ago. It was a poem that someone gave her um, by an anonymous author, and she had it hanging in her room from the time all of us were little babies. And it goes like this. Cleaning and scrubbing can wait till tomorrow. For babies grow up, we've learned to our sorrow. So quiet down cobwebs, dust go to sleep. I'm rocking my baby, and babies don't keep. Babies don't keep. 
Let's take the time with them we have right now. We're gonna sit, we're gonna hold our babies, we're gonna nurse our babies, we're gonna play games, we're gonna help with the homework, we're gonna see the laundry, we're gonna see the dirty dishes, and they're still gonna be there. And the kids can stand at the counter and be involved and they can rinse dishes and they'll get water everywhere and that's okay because they're being part of the family and they're playing. And they can snuggle in and they can play games and they might tip over the game of Candyland and that's okay because they were playing and they were involved in the family and the cards pick back up. But we have to remember that these little moments are precious, not just for us to have memories, but for those kids as they grow and develop in that mental attitude. So things we can do to help incorporate them into our day is dinner. We all eat dinner. We sometimes have some crazy evening schedules. Maybe breakfast would be easier for your family, but eat a meal together. Share a meal together. One of our favorite things is to ask, what was your favorite part of the day? What was the best thing that happened today? And we ask that every night at dinner. And we've been doing it so long that now our kids turn around and ask us, what was, your, what was the best part of your day? You know, let's talk about it. And sometimes when it's been a hard day, it's really good to find the good thing that came out of it, even if that good thing is just the fact that you're having dinner with your family, that the people you love most in the world are in the same place at the same time being together. And that's huge for our kids' mental attitude as well. Work toward a common goal. Have a family piggy bank together. Save up for either a vacation or an event or um, buying a new game. Or, or for my daughter, she apparently is saving for a puppy. Like, I don't even know if we're getting a puppy, right? But she's saving for a puppy with her brother. And they're very excited about that. So they're working toward a common goal. We're working in these things for us together. So we've looked at this. We've talked about nutrition for our kiddos from early on. And as they start to develop those palates, uh, we've talked about exercise and playing with them. Uh, we've talked about their sleep habits and patterns and that mental attitude and how a lot of that comes from their family life. Um, but now we think, okay, that nervous system, how does that work? How does that work? And if I'm going to have their nervous system checked, well, my kid doesn't really like going to the doctor, right? A lot of kids don't like going to the doctor. Well, that's kind of good news because we're taught to go to the doctor only when we're sick, right? And if I'm sick and I don't feel well, I don't want someone poking and prodding at me, but I want to start well. I want to be well and make sure I'm staying well. And the good news is the body wants to keep itself healthy. It wants to keep itself well. That's where chiropractic comes into play. No one else checks the nervous system like chiropractors check the nervous system to help keep the body healthy. So chiropractic, what is it? Well, it's gentle. It's natural. It's easy. It works with your body. And usually when kids and families come in for care, the siblings actually argue over who gets to go first. How many times have you taken your kids to the doctor and they're like, oh, me, 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 me. I want to go. I want to go. You went first last time. Now, not to say when kids come in, it's always a, a battle of who gets on the table, right? But they're excited. They want to be under care. They like to be adjusted. They feel good. You know, you can't fake that in a kid. There's no fake in that. They tell you straight up, I like it or I don't, right? Feels good or it doesn't. So when kids come in and they're excited to be adjusted and they want to be here with their parents and they want to help adjust their parents while their parents are on the table, that's an exciting thing right? So it's gentle, it's natural, it's easy. And the whole goal is to help get your brain talking to your body better. The safety pin cycle is a really good way to look at this, okay? So I, I'm not going to read the whole thing for you, but if you look at that safety pin, the big end's the brain, the little end's the body, and when they're connected, we're at ease. We're functioning. We're working. We're moving through life the way we should be. That nervous system, again, is your master system. Our brain controls our entire body, and our body runs on that electricity from our brain. So if that electricity is distorted on the way down from the brain or on the way back up, and that distortion or that um, disconnectedness is there, then we're in a state of dis-ease. Now, we throw around the word disease all the time, and we forget that the dis means I'm without ease. So now, how do I get back to ease as much as possible, and how do I stay there? That's our goal with adults. And sometimes, if there's a birth trauma with a baby, that's the goal with the little one, 
right? But they have a lot better ability to heal and they haven't had that trauma for 20 or 30 or 40 plus years, right? It might be a couple weeks or a couple months and we're doing a little makeup round and then we're getting that moving forward for that kid to be powered up. So when we look at that, that brain controlling the body, that means the power that made the body works to heal the body works to heal the body. The nervous system is one of the first things to develop and it's controlling everything and it tells everything what to become as we develop. And so the power that made that body, body works to heal that body. And when the brain talks to the body better and we're working in our nutrition and our exercise and our rest and our mental attitude, those are all things that move us toward health. And when my nervous system is functioning better, I use all those other approaches to health in my body even better because I can sort them out better. I function better overall. So um, I, I, I want to I wanna look at this with you too. One of the, one of the main reasons um, uh, for calling a pediatrician or a medical doctor when you have a little one is a fever right? We, we get nervous about that. So when we think about that power that made the body healing the body, I want you to think about fevers with me a little bit. First of all, let's classify what a fever is. There's different grades to a fever and there's different behaviors that happen when you have a fever. Behaviors with a fever that, that might be a concern are, list, are listlessness versus lethargy. Listlessness is kind of normal when you have a fever. This is like, oh, I just don't really feel good. I'm just kind of chill and I'm responsive and I'll make eye contact with you, but I'm not super, you know, interested in having a conversation. Lethargy is I'm not going to make eye contact. I'm not really um, interested in talking at all. I'm really actually not very responsive, not really wanting to move. That's a concern. A tonic neck, a rigid neck, not wanting to tuck the chin or turn the head that would be a concern with a fever. Twitching with a fever would be a concern. Sleep, this is a normal thing. Your kids should sleep more when they have a fever. They're putting all their energy into healing, so they put themselves to sleep to restore themselves. Different grades of fever. A fever actually isn't a fever until we're out about 104. And that's a low-grade fever. 100 to about 102 is a low-grade fever. So sometimes when we get up to 102, 103, we're told, oh, my gosh, give them the Tylenol, give them ibuprofen, alternate back and forth, and we have to get this fever down, right? Well, a fever is a healthy, normal response. Remember, the power that made that body heals that body. So when we have a bacteria in us or a virus in us, our body's natural response is to raise the temperature to cook the crud without cooking us. So 100 to 102, that's a really good low-grade fever. That's, all right, kiddo, take a drink of water. Let's keep some fluids in you. You go to sleep. You cook that crud, and you wake up better. That's going to be a lot better. A moderate fever is 102 to 104. Um, and honestly, in that first year of life, if they're, if they're in that range, they're doing okay. As they start to get up to 104, you, you want to start watching for some of the lethargy things, um, maybe tonic neck, but really you want to keep, uh, you really want to keep them hydrated. You want to keep them um, uh, eating living foods. A higher grade fever is 104 to 107. Now we're getting into a concern area. Anything above that is concern. You would want to bring that fever down as soon as possible. But if, if your kid is in that low grade to moderate fever range, their body is doing what it's supposed to do. And if they're in those ranges without the lethargy, without the tonic neck, without the twitching, their body is having a healthy immune response to cook the crud. Now, funny thing, when kids are adjusted, when, they, when they're adjusted by a chiropractor and that chiropractor is removing interference from their nervous system by correcting dysfunction in the spine, it moves them toward normal. It moves them toward a healthy normal. So if a kid is not feeling well and they need an immune system boost and they're adjusted, they might get a little fever after they're just a little low grade to moderate fever to cook the crud. If the kid's fever has been high and it's been high for a while and hasn't been able to break and come back down when they're adjusted, it moves toward normal. Now that's not to say the chiropractic adjustment is healing them. They are the only thing that heals them. We are the only things that heal ourselves. I don't heal anybody but me, right? 
But when we're when these kids are adjusted and that nervous system is allowed to function better, everything in the body starts to move toward normal. So kid, so again, um, the power that made that body heals that body. So when that kid has a fever, it's a healthy response. So we don't need to rush just to, to things to make that fever lower. We want to keep the kid hydrated and make sure that they're able to sleep. Other things chiropractic can help with are things like ADHD, ADD, bedwetting issues. We've seen a lot of kids get better with this. We've seen a lot of kids focus better in school. Sports injuries, this helps kids be able to stay on the field, run better, function better, breathe better, can help things like asthma symptoms. Decreases ear infections because it's consistently helping the eustachian tubes drain better and boosting the immune system. And, and tons of other things. Again, we take care of families and we take care of them for lifetime wellness. We're not treating specifically bedwetting or specifically ear infections. What we're doing is taking interference out of the nervous system so that the brain talks to the body the best it can and it can coordinate all the other approaches we talked about to moving us toward that optimal function, toward that 100%. If you have any other questions about this or anything, um, uh, any questions that stimulated or any other thoughts or, or anything you want to talk about, you can give us a call. You can find our information at fosteringwellness.net. Um, again, this is Dr. Renee Thompson, and uh, I am so happy that you were able to join us today to be able to go over this information. Um, again, our website is fosteringwellness.net. And I hope uh, that as you make choices going forward and as you make those tricky uh, choices as a parent going forward, that some of them maybe just got a little easier, maybe a little clearer, maybe some of them just got a little uh, thought provoking. Um, anyway, I'm glad you're able to join us today. I hope you have a fantastic day. Make sure you go home and you take that time with your precious little ones. We'll talk to you soon. Have a great one.